Um, what I thought I would do today is just briefly talk about what it is I was trying to do in this book and give you a flavor of what content you can find if you go to Amazon or your local bookstore to get yourself a copy. And what I'm trying to do in this book most fundamentally is give a uh, particular conception of the right to health care that fits between what I take to be two uh, uh, general approaches. Um, and it's against this backdrop where we have two general um, findings. One is this finding that is, of course, there is a right to health care as a matter of law. There is a host of entitlements to health care as part of the international right to health um, that really every country has, has bound itself to recognize. And in addition, at least 67% of world constitutions recognize that in their uh, recognize a right to health care or health care services. And some 40 something percent of those are justiciable. Which leads to one finding that I, I found quite interesting, Jeff King's comment in Judging Social Rights, that saying there are no social rights, like a right to health or a right to health care, is just a bad argument we don't need to contend with. But the other piece of background and finding is that there's this host of important arguments about the conceptual foundations of what it means to have a right. In order to have a right that is said, we need to have a duty. And we need to have a duty holder who has something specifiable that they need to do. It can't just be that you say, I have a right, and that nothing follows from it, uh, from what other people need to do. We need to figure out what it is they need to do. And it's really hard to give an account of what specific healthcare goods needed to be provided by what specific individuals. And so you get in something like uh, Gopal Srinivasan's excellent article, A Right to Health, Some Inconclusive Skepticism, a claim that it's fine to use right to health or right to health care language, but it's only for rhetorical purposes. Philosophical strictures demand something more precise. And so in between these two very different compelling thoughts, I want to make sense of a right to health care in a way that can meet some philosophical strictures and yet make and yet account for the fact that there is widespread legal recognition. Because we either have a big break between theory and practice, or there's something missing in our philosophical accounts that we need to beef up. And so what I'm trying to do in this book is provide a concept of the a conception of the right to health care that explains the legal phenomenon in ways that explains why there is a duty to provide it, why states must provide certain health care goods, and give some content to that that has concrete realities. But what I'm not going to do is just assume that it should be a legal right. I'm trying to specify a moral right that can meet these strictures and can explain the legal phenomenon and then when I say we can use this to guide our analysis of whether it is a good idea to recognize a uh, legal right to health to achieve what we would want our moral right to health to do. And then I say, well, you know, you might be interested in this only as a legal phenomenon. If so, you can read this whole book a different way as a conditional argument, as saying, if you're going to recognize a legal right to health care, you ought to only recognize it if it fulfills the, the structure of a right to health care that I've put forward. Okay, that's all very abstract. What do I actually say the right to health care needs to be? Well, the book proceeds in two, two parts. One is the theory, the second is the uh, proof of concept or case study for it. And in the first part, I explain what I think that the most plausible conception of a right to health care should be. And in order to do this, I first lay out what I take to be some of the problems that any conception of a right to health care ought to address. One I call the principle problem of scope. It's related to the problem of principles of scope. And it effectively says it's really hard to figure out what's in and what's out when we're specifying a right to health care. If we make it too narrow, we're not talking about a right to health care. We're talking about a right to some particular health care goods. If we make it too broad, we're not really talking about a right to health care anymore at a certain point. We're just talking about a right to everything that could possibly make us healthy. And that's not going to add to our moral ontology either. 
We might think we can appeal to principles to solve this problem, and yet many of them think equality of opportunity, um, think you know the goods necessary for basic autonomy, basic health, admit borderline cases. So even still, we're going to need to specify the scope more clearly. There's also a problem of what I call the problem of time and space, which says, you know, it's just a fact that the healthcare goods we're going to need are going to change depending on where we are and, depend and are going to change over time. We need a conception of the right that's going to be sensitive to these contextual changes. There's a problem of measurement. We need to figure out um, how we know whether this right is being fulfilled or not. And then there's what I call the problem of correlativity. We need to figure out who owes what. Let's say we can fill the scope of the right. Who needs to do what in order to fulfill it and why? Why I think that states need to provide some set of, of goods or another? And I say, I begin to look at different conceptions that are out there on the table. And I say, you know, one route you could go is say some substantive set of goods need to be provided. Uh, but the problem with these conceptions is that many of them are still going to admit borderline cases, um, and it's going to be hard to change them over time. So we do seem to need some procedural element to our right. But at the same time, if the right is purely procedural, we say, look, I don't, I, I'm afraid that if I say it's a right to insulin, but then insulin's not useful anymore, uh, well, now I'm stuck with that as part of the right. You might think, okay, well then let's go procedural. What we need is fair procedures. And what I say is, if it's only a procedural right, then you might ask yourself, what does the right to health care add that just having a right to fair procedures wouldn't give us anyway? And so what I say is in order to best meet these challenges, we need a conception of the right to health care that I call pluralist. Um, I've since preferred the term complex. I think pluralist is a bit misleading. We can talk about that in the question period. Um, but complex or pluralist right that views the right to health care as a unity that includes some basic substantive content, the goods necessary for a dignified existence. Um, think World Health Organization recognized essential medicines, basic maternal and infant care, think basic vaccinations. And I say, look, these are a really basic core of goods that are A, already recognized as part of an international right, but B, do seem necessary for even the basic level of health and well being that are presupposed to even act in a global uh, system like our own. It's what we all need. And I think if states fail to provide this, they're failing to meet uh, basic conditions of legitimacy. And so we can make some sense of a correlative duty to fulfill these basic substantive uh, goods. But I say, even this is going to admit borderline cases. And we might want more than just this basic minimum in a rights-based framework. So I think we need B, procedural justice in healthcare decision-making. Um, I use Daniels and Sabin's uh, accountability for reasonableness framework as a way of filling in this gap. And then I say three, uh, instrumental to that, we need a basically functioning healthcare system. And what I do at the end of part one is I actually say each of these three components requires, it actually entails certain measurements we can use to apply to different healthcare systems. And so in part two, I actually apply it to the Canadian healthcare system. I do it both to the general Medicare-based system and then to um, particular programs for um, vulnerable, for lack of a better word, populations in Canada. In particular, the non-insured health benefits program uh, for Indigenous Canadians and the interim federal health program for uh, refugee claimants and Canadians, uh, refugee claimants in Canada. And I apply the metrics and identify certain gaps in realization of the substantive and procedural elements of uh, right to health care realization as I understand them. Now, some of these problems are very familiar. Um, they include the lack of coverage in the Medicare system of uh, many basic pharmaceutical goods outside of hospital and physician services sectors. They include um, real gaps in reason provision for what is covered and what is not. Um, but I think it's useful to uh, apply them in, through a rights-based framework. And what I do in the end of the book is I then um, look at the tools of public law and examine 
if in how they can help Canada better realize the right to health care, as I understand it, as a complex right. Um, and what I end up to, where I end up is with a somewhat skeptical view of um, hard law tools as a way of addressing the problems that we have, and really um, trucking for some to some extent for uh, ombudspersons and national health care strategies as um, effective softer law tools to fill some of those gaps. This is a very uh, nutshell view of a admittedly somewhat dense book, but I hope I've whet your appetite enough that we can have a good discussion about it. And I'm happy to provide more details um, after the what I'm sure will be fascinating comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. That was wonderful. Um, and if uh, we could ask Catherine, uh, Professor Catherine Young to make her comments now. Thank you, Colleen, and thank you, Michael. So it's very uh, exciting to be here at the launch of a very exciting book, The Pluralist Right to Healthcare. I would say this is an extraordinarily timely book, given where we find ourselves two years into a predicted but still unexpected global pandemic, which has brought with it astonishing numbers of deaths around the world, new forms of distrust, in settings in which public health expertise is so pressing, unimaginable pressures within hospital settings over the decisions now being made, still being made with scarce resources, terrible inequalities in the burden of the disease, particularly along grounds of race and along grounds of place, both in terms of who is burdened but who is dying from this disease, as well as who has access to vaccines to prevent it, as well as the knowledge to trust vaccines and the capabilities to avoid the worst effects of the disease otherwise. So as everyone here appreciates, uh, this is a timely book uh, that uh, spearheads a framework that isn't applied within the book to COVID. It came earlier than that, but really helps to solve some of the instant questions that we have in a far more reflective way than, the, than we'd have otherwise, otherwise available to us. And I think what um, really holds apart a rights approach from other approaches to addressing the COVID pandemic is the way in which it highlights what has been so preventable about this global pandemic, given our current structures of health systems, uh, as well as the incredible inequality that really goes to the issue of moral inequality that underlies a rights-based approach. Michael's, uh, Michael's approach focuses on dignity and other values that are also highlighted in this setting. So let me say I write about economic and social rights generally, not only the right to healthcare, but also the right to housing, education, food, water, sanitation, social security. Uh, in all times inquiring as to what our legal systems can do if we reflect upon a basic moral insight that all humans require some guaranteed access to the material dimensions of our lives, whether that's based on moral equality, on human freedoms or capabilities, or moral decency or dignity, as Michael himself stresses. So the importance of economic and social was recognized, uh, social rights was recognized. Um, most were named as human rights as far back as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. Uh, they've been incorporated in a majority of the world's constitution, as uh, Michael already stipulated. Uh, they're also expressed in distinctive social movements who occupy spaces at different lengths from human rights frameworks or constitutional paradigms, but also who seek out the moral language of rights, rights talk, as it's described in the book. So in my work, I explore whether naming and systematizing these goods, services, entitlements, you can call them commodities in legal systems, is likely to increase or decrease their access whether naming these as rights opens up channels of political participation and mobilization that would be otherwise unavailable or else deflects or demobilizes or co-ops such groups and social movements. Whether the rights language opens up, up, opens up forms of judicial responsiveness and accountability or otherwise opens up forms of judicial usurpation or judicial abdication and also the question as to whether there's something generalizable about all of these dimensions together, 
or whether disparate economic and social rights are best treated as separate and disaggregated and conceptualized and measured distinctively. So Michael's book adds considerably to these questions. In reading it, I have learned about how deploying a pluralist or complex structure to the right to healthcare can provide an action guiding and realizable basis for law and policy. I've been helped to understand how the plural duties that can be incorporated in a legal and public policy framework within Canada, including for vulnerable and marginalized populations can be helped by a right to healthcare analysis. So the book is full of usable recommendations for sympathetic executive and legislative branches. It's compatible also with scientific progress and new developments under science in terms of therapeutic and preventable strategies around healthcare. And this often sets health rights apart from the other economic and social rights I mentioned. So this is no small feat. Uh, the right to health care, uh, as is the right to health more generally, uh, is full of notorious conceptual snags and analytical loops and is indeed full of literature that's openly hostile to the rights framework, uh, particularly from analytical philosophers who remain unconvinced that these gaps and contradictions are surmountable. And uh, Michael does a great job addressing the objections of philosophers like Honora O'Neill, even going back to the seminal work of Wesley uh, Hofeld and his incredible analysis of rights and correlate duties to bring analysis to bear on these issues. He also draws upon the frameworks of Amartya Sen and his capabilities approach, Jennifer Ruba and her application of incompletely theorized agreements, which draws on Cass Sunstein's and even John Rawls accounts, uh, as well as Norman Daniels, his work on accountability through reasonableness. And Michael does a great job of drawing the insights of these sympathetic readers to a very contemporary analysis of the right to healthcare. So it's a wonderful book. I'll address one quibble I have, which is based on a different diagnosis of the issue, which I think ar arises when we give credence to the ideological and political assumptions that serve as obstacles to the right to health care, rather than the conceptual and logical matters. For instance, Michael does a great job disassembling the positive and the negative conceptions of obligations that correlate with the right to health care, focusing on why we have been overly concerned with the negative framework. And of course, the current paradigm in international human rights law traverses these distinctions through the respect, protect and fulfill framework as well as offering a formula to approach the balancing of limitations or derogations from human rights, including the right to health care. This is famous from Canada as elsewhere. Um, but this approach does not give credence to the ideological power of what we're still occupying, which is a neoliberal paradigm, which would see the running of the state as best thought out in terms of efficiency and particularly the running of public health systems, how they're funded, how hospitals and pharmaceuticals are paid for, what costs can be put appropriately on individual users, and how a paradigm of individual choice serves public health and healthcare objectives. So similarly, Michael does a great job of discussing the benefits of progress without addressing the neoliberal intellectual property paradigm that would commodify and patent progress through the TRIPS agreement applied uh, internationally. So these are objections that call our attention to our political and ideological assumptions that are completely embedded in this neoliberal framework in which this kind of analysis will do well to address directly. These quibbles, if I can conclude, are really directed to how such an action guiding and realizable set of insights, which are so beautifully and elegantly made, can also be action forcing and realized within the, con the contemporary settings of political economy, Canada included. Uh, I know that that's a kind of interdisciplinary reach, but Michael has shown himself so adept at interdisciplinary study. And that's where I'll rest my, my comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was wonderful um, and so rich with uh, your own reflections from your own work as well. So we'll really look forward to the, the Q&A with Michael. Thank you, Kath. Um, and now we would like to ask Professor Lisa Foreman if, um, if she could make some comments as well. Thank you, Lisa, for being here. <laughs> 
Well, thank you, Colleen, for the invitation. Uh, it's such a pleasure to participate in this launch uh, for Michael's excellent book and to be able to participate in this discussion along with such uh, outstanding uh, colleagues in the field. I, Michael, I want to congratulate you on your book. I think it's such a wonderful contribution to the literature. And I think your book does several ambitious things that are really done when it comes to the right to health and does them exceedingly well. Uh, firstly, in uh, providing an account of the right to health that bridges both philosophy and law, which is something very rarely done. You usually have philosophers who speak past the, the specifics of law or lawyers who completely ignore <laughs> philosophy. So I think when, by being able to bring those two pieces together and ground your analysis in both schools of thought so effectively, I think this is an extraordinary contribution. Um, the second place where I think you make a really distinctive contribution is in this uh, notion of a pluralist right to health or complex right to health, which brings in not just the substantive and procedural aspects of the right to health, but also very explicitly brings the health system into the domain of the right to health. And this is a piece of your work that I look very forward to seeing what you do in the future, uh, the way you specifically expand the health system piece. There are other things that you do that I think are also really wonderful contributions, uh, the way that you conceptualize core obligations and the way that you apply the right to health in Canada. Um, I really look forward to the work that you're going to be doing in the future, Michael. It's such a pleasure to see a former student take uh, their place in the scholarship like this and make such a fantastic contribution to the literature. Um, so my comments are going to be somewhat contextualizing. I'm a legal scholar on, on the right to health and international law, and I'm very much engaged with the legal conceptualization, interpretation, and implementation of those rights. So my comments are, are really going to focus on some of those aspects. And for the most part, they're very, they're, they're really contextualizing and not critical of what Michael says. My one quibble uh, is not, will not be a surprise to Michael. Um, so when Michael took my course on the right to health and international law uh, several years ago and consistently spoke of a right to health care and not a right to health, I'd consistently correct him and say, no, no, it's <laughs> the right to health, not a right to health care. So I really appreciated reading Michael's really Full, uh, fulsome justification for why he speaks of a right to health care, not health, even though I don't fully uh, agree with or I don't agree with the idea that we should uh, contract the right to health down to health care. But I think what you do really well, Michael, is make a very convincing case for why we should really focus on a distinctive right to health care, which is both a part of and somewhat separable from the broader right to health, which in international human rights law is defined in an inclusive way to extend both to healthcare and also to uh, some of the social determinants of health. And so Michael, what I thought was really convincing in your justification was the idea that we should separate out a right to healthcare because a right to health which extends both to healthcare and the social determinants runs the, the threat of being both amorphous and overly demanding. Even as Michael does acknowledge that if social determinants are ultimately more important than healthcare when it comes to health, then the book is a good start, uh, starting point for that inquiry. So I, where I think the, the, that argument is really interesting and illuminating is that I think it gives us some important insight into one of what I would say is one of the core central failures of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in interpreting the right to health, which is in defining core obligations under the right to health, which they defined to include more underlying determinants of health like food, shelter, sanitation, water, than elements of essential health care. They only include essential medicines in that uh, interpretation in general, comment 14. And I think that that choice uh, to include more in underlying determinants and less health care very effectively illustrates how difficult the committee found it to conceptualize a feasible set of core obligations that included both essential health care and social determinants. So I think in some ways Michael's uh, approach of defining the right to health care separately within the border bounds of the right to health is a really exciting and promising way to very carefully elaborate the content of that right in the context of resource 
constraints, even if I don't still agree that uh, we should reduce the right to health in international law to healthcare law, and I'm not even sure Michael's suggesting that we do. But, you know, I, I'm a legal scholar located in the School of uh, Public Health, where I've spent most of my independent career, and it's extraordinarily clear that as fundamentally important as healthcare is to population health, the majority of population health is determined by the social determinants of health. So if the overall premise of the right to health is to be concerned with population health, it's not sufficient to say that health is attended to by other economic, social and cultural rights like housing, food and sanitation. We need a unifying theory of, uh, of health rights, which I think the international human right uh, does provide. Um, but I think Michael is right that if we do separate healthcare, we also need to recognize the need to better conceptualize the way health social determinants fit into the right to health. So I think to some extent issues of scope are fundamental to some of the challenges that we've had in understanding and conceptualizing and enforcing the right. And I wanna just also join in uh, Catherine's remarks about um, the, the present moment of COVID. I mean, we, we know that over the past 30 years, we've seen extraordinary changes and evolution in the legal interpretation and implementation of the right to health, but we're, we still, irrespective, have faced significant challenges around how we conceptualize the scope and enforceability. But in so many ways, COVID has really uh, created somewhat of an inflection point for some of these questions. Uh, and I'd say that it's forced, forcing an inflection point for aspects of how we understand the right to health in particular and how we understand human rights in relation to health more generally. So we've seen, all of us have seen on a daily basis really, how during COVID people's rights to effective prevention, treatment and care has often been under tremendous pressure. And we see from, you know, looking back at the last uh, to something years and forward that no amount of rights, international law, institutional innovation, moral rhetoric has prevented the kind of resource hoarding and mass disparities in access to vaccines that we see. At the same time, uh, socially, politically, legally, around the world, societies are very much engaged in intensive debate about what is or isn't legitimate ways to balance individual rights with public health imperatives like lockdowns, travel restrictions, mask and vaccine mandates. And what's notable in these ongoing debates is that there's a very significant gap. There's just a giant hole in those discussions where economic, social and cultural rights should fit in. We very rarely ever see a discussion or recognition that we should be placing economic, social and cultural rights under the same kinds of limitations, criteria as civil and political rights. Economic, social and cultural rights are not part of the Syracuse principles, which is fair, those were created in the context of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but they are, aren't part also of some of the contemporary uh, 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 initiatives that we've seen prompted during COVID to reconceptualize human rights principles during public health emergencies. And I think that this giant hole in human rights discourse and practice to some extent reflect the continuing problems that we have in defining the scope and uh, enforceability of economic, social and cultural rights in ways that balances individual rights and collective interests with uh, always limited resources. And those challenges manifest in two distinct places where I think Michael's arguments make important contributions. First, in the concept of core obligations, uh, which Catherine has written extraordinary work on, um, and second, in the shifting standards of adjudication of this right, and I think there's a real significant through line in both of those pieces. So I, core obligations are a tremendously controversial part of the international legal interpretation of economic, social and cultural rights. The Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights introduced those concepts, uh, the, the standards very early in his work to try and provide a minimum uh, 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 floor to economic, social and cultural rights that could protect against any kind of deprivation in the name of progressive realization within resources and which the committee defined ver very clumsily in relation to the right to health in general comment 14. And the controversy on around core obligations attaches in two respects, like first generally, 
critics say, you know, there's no direct treaty text that gave rise to this concept. And it's a free floating uh, concept that delegitimizes um, it's legit, which is delegitimized because states didn't consent to anything comparable to it. On the other hand, the critiques have been that uh, very specific to the committee's definition of core obligations under the Right Elk and General Comment 14, which really does, uh, you know, flub the exercise. Uh, in General Comment 14, the committee uh, excessively narrows the content of these duties when it comes to health care. Uh, it only includes essential drugs and moves most of what we would expect to see in essential primary health care into a conceptually meaningless uh, 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 cognate category calls comparable priority obligations. The second thing it does is make the standard of enforcement far too stringent in suggesting that those uh, obligations are non-derogable. Now these, I, I've come to think of these choices as kind of late night decisions that the committee made uh, in terms of trying to come up with a feasible set of obligations that were not overly demanding on resources, but yet still had some strength of enforceability. I think the committee very quickly realized its error, given how they've approached core obligations in subsequent interpretations, dropping the notion of uh, non-derogability, expanding uh, related uh, uh, interpretations of core, uh, health rights related core obligations to something closer to essential primary health care, something we saw in General Comment 22 on sexual reproductive health rights, which says in part states hold a core obligation to ensure universal and equitable access to affordable, acceptable, good quality sexual reproductive health services, goods and facilities. So I imagine if the committee could revise its approach to core obligations under the right to health, it would look a lot more like a core duty to ensure universal, equitable access to affordable, good quality, essential health care uh, services, goods and facilities. And so I think Michael's argument for core obligations that include essential medicines, immunization, <clears throat> basic maternal infant care treatments for at least major disease, I think is a very persuasive way to conceptualize that duty, irrespective of the role that core obligations may play in adjudication. And this is the second place where I think the approach to conceptualizing the right health is very much in flux, where Michael's book and his analysis can offer some support, which is in the way in which we conceptualize the standards of adjudicating of adjudication for economic, social, and cultural rights like health. So in the, the optional protocol on the, on the international covenant that was adopted uh, in uh, or, or close to 10 years ago, uh, the committee, instead of transferring the, the textual standards of progressive realization within available resources, took up the standard notion of uh, reasonableness of steps uh, taken by state parties, which is somewhat drawn from South African constitutional court jurisprudence on economic, social and cultural rights, and certainly also driven by interstate uh, politics during negotiations. Uh, but I think the, rec the, the choice of the reasonableness standard also was uh, in recognition of the significant equity problems that had become evident out of the Latin American enforcement of economic, social and cultural rights, and specifically of the right health, where far too much weight had been given to core obligation-based terms and claims and not enough to resource constraints. And I think what's interesting here is to see the evolution in those standards that has taken place since the optional protocol has, has come into uh, uh, operation, where in the committee's uh, decisions on individual uh, communications, they have not only started to develop the reasonableness standard, but also started to shift into another part of the treaty, which is Article 4, which says limitations of covenant rights can only be those determined by law compatible with the nature of rights and solely for the purpose of promoting the general welfare and democratic society. It's a provision somewhat similar to what we see in the Canadian chart in Section 1. Um, and what's really interesting there is to see how that uh, approach is evolving. So uh, 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 one of its earlier decisions uh, in 2016, um, the court, uh, the, the committee decided that restrictions under rights must be provided by law, be reasonable and proportionate and should gar guarantee at least a minimum level of benefits. And this is really interesting because we're seeing the committee uh, cobble together uh, sets of criteria for enforcing uh, adjudication of economic, social and cultural rights, which brings together uh, core obligations, a reasonableness review, and imports a Syracuse-like uh, principle of proportionality into the mix. Um, Sandra Liebenberg, a very uh, esteemed South African scholar and a former committee member, said, you know, what this approach shows is that rather than applying a rule like the 
doctrinal analysis in assessing the compatibility of reductions in social rights. The, de the committee is developing a, a set of ac accountability criteria where negative deprivations, failure to ensure minimum essential levels of covenant rights, discrimination and retrogressive measures are presumed to constitute prima facie breaches of the covenant. So I'll maybe close there and just say, you know, the state of legal interpretation of the right to health is in an interesting state of flux. And I think that legal analysis like Michael's are incredibly important ways for the broader community as a whole to think of different ways and innovative ways of grounding the legal development of this right going forward. And I'll, I'll end my remarks there. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa. That was um, so insightful and, and uh, thoughtful. And we, uh, I'm sure we're gonna have a terrific uh, conversation after this um, to our participants. Um, if you're thinking of your questions uh, or comments, could you uh, pop them into the Q&A function? Uh, and now we will turn for the final set of comments before we go back to Michael, uh, to Professor Venakatapuram. Shridhar, please. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. Hi, Michael. Hi, Colleen. Um, it's so lovely to join you this afternoon from London. And also, Michael is now in the UK. So we are all at least on the same continent this time. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to give a brief um, sort of response and comment to this, uh, this work. Um, and I want to first by start by saying that it's, uh, I recommend it to everyone. It's something that if you are interested in uh, whether it's a domestic right to health care or international or regional or um, sort of, you know, a legal approach to health care entitlements, I think it's worthwhile taking a look at it. One of the most impressive aspects about this book that I have not read in so long is that it is a profoundly well-researched discussion, which, uh, you know, has probably the most comprehensive and up-to-date references for many of the different topics that Michael decides to take up. But even minor topics, he sort of profoundly uh, understands the topics and provides all the, you know, sort of required references for it. So I'm sure that I will be going back to this book a number of times in order to sort of look up to see what the what the right references are, or the leading references and sources are for various sort of topics. Um, so I guess I will um, sort of respond by um, sort of uh, telling you about a conversation that I had, uh, because I think, um, you know, the first um, sort of response mentioned Onara Neal, and I think that's probably the best way to start with this conversation, which is that, um, so, you know, after Onara wrote this article called The Dark Side of Human Rights, um, it was a very kind of difficult uh, essay for me to read, particularly coming out of a human rights uh, sort of world and organization interested in sort of the philosophy of human rights to, to read such a, a, an article that was so critical of the concept of human rights and the weaknesses and et cetera. Um, but when in the conversation, so I, you know, sort of was basically like, you know, what is this article about? And why did you do it? And the and the and the response she gives is well, you know, when you care about human rights so much, then you have to be much more sort of willing to look at it in a much more critical way. It's because we want it to uh, the ideas to persevere and persist that we are taking a much more critical uh, to look at it. So um, so with that, I you know I want to sort of respond by saying that. Uh, usually I don't spend time um, critiquing other people's work. Um, that's partly because no one really likes to hear critics. Uh, and also most people really don't, um, you know, I don't think it's worthwhile spending so much time on other people's work as much as trying to do something of one's own um, in order to see if it persists. But in this case, I want to sort of say to Michael that the, you know, because you're both joining me on this side of the world, but also you're joining this sort of world of uh, individuals who want the right to health and right to health care and a human right to health to be something that matters in the world. I'm going to suggest some three things that I found about the book that I would um, sort of, you know, sort of require further discussions about. So the first thing is that there are enormous number of um, sort of references throughout the book to the latest literature, 
what I found very surprising was that there were three women that were missing from the discussions and the books. Um, and I found that really interesting because I thought that they were so relevant and they had made such significant contributions to this area that I didn't understand why they weren't in the book. So the three women are Martha Nussbaum, Judith Jarvis Thompson, and then Brigitte Tobes. So I'll start with Brigitte Tobes first, is that Brigitte Tobes is sort of my hero, um, partly because she wrote the first monograph on the human right to health and she's a lawyer she's works in Amsterdam or she lives in uh, the Netherlands and she teaches at the University of Groningen and she wrote her book in 1998 um, and so I do think that everyone who's working on the international human right to health does owe a hat tip to Brigitte Tobes for her book in the beginning and her ability to engage with that literature and to establish it. Um, so, you know, there are claims to be the first book of this and first book of that, but I think that there is sort of something to be said about her taking on uh, the, the right to health in international law and sort of trying to uh, lay out the land and the contours for that. Uh, the second thing is that <clears throat> from what I understood, from this book and what I took away, the argument is that it's a pluralist conception of a right to healthcare because the right entails three things. Uh, one is that they're sort of goods for basic dignity, two is procedural justice, and three is a health system. And this is what it means by a pluralist account of the good. And I think that, um, and there's an enormous amount of literature on Hofeld going all the way to 1911. I've never really understood why people keep going back to Hofeld. Everybody who sort of goes to it just suddenly says, well, it's inadequate and doesn't really work, but nevertheless seems to keep sort of quoting it. And I find this sort of a bit of a waste of time. But I do think that Judith Thompson did an excellent um, assessment of the concept of rights in a book called The Realm of Rights. And in particular, the concept of a cluster right, I think, is really valuable here, in which she argues that in any sort of uh, rights claim or a, 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 cl a right that we're talking about when it involves a complex concept is not just a claim right in the Hofeldian sense, but it also has lots of other things in it. It has powers, immunities, privileges, etc. So we have to think about this kind of right as being a cluster right. And I think that that sort of idea, given its significant contributions to our uh, understanding of how rights are, you know, how rights, what rights are, and what they work, is missing from this book, um, and I think that's a, that's an important sort of gap in in the way that we um, discuss rights by not acknowledging that concept or her contribution to our understanding of rights. The third person, the third woman that's missing, is Martha Nussbaum. And I found this very interesting because, if I understand it, so uh, Michael's argument is that. Uh, and I quote, if my political conception of dignity is plausible, the basic content of the right to health care will be politically oriented. It can be specified by pointing to the goods necessary to have the basic level of well-being required to be a political actor capable of having one's interests known in the global community. So to me, that sounds like very much a cosmopolitan account of a decent life. Um, and that sounds like a, a political account by meaning not in terms of party politics, but actually as in a political community in the classic sense. So um, Martha's work uh, for now over two, three decades has been very much to come up with a cosmopolitan account of basic sort of human dignity and what that entails in terms of claims to various kinds of capabilities to a decent flourishing life um, across the world wherever you find them. So given that the conception is, seems to be so close, I don't see uh, you know, sufficient understanding or acknowledgement of that kind of work. Um, but I also find that the grounding in dignity is, uh, despite our the discussion about all the different ways of dignity and understanding dignity, there is much more work to be done about how you ground a moral claim into dignity, particularly a cosmopolitan conception of human dignity as well. Um, and Martha has done sort of lots of work on it. And so I spend my time just writing her coattails and sort of saying whatever she said, I'm happy with that and I'll keep going. So I think here without Martha's work um, on that sort of cosmopolitan account of dignity and claims, there is a lot more work to be done, but also quite puzzling that she's missing from the book. 
So aside from these three missing women from the book, I want to speak about two other things that I think uh, very quickly. One is that um, I think uh, Michael here relies heavily on Norman Daniels' work, as he acknowledges from the beginning. He's like, this is, book is profoundly inspired by Daniels' work on the right to health care, but he feels as though that's not uh, sort of done well. But nevertheless, uh, towards the end, in the procedural justice part of the pluralist account of right to health care, he relies on Daniels, Daniels and Sabin's accountability for reasonableness in priority setting of health care. And, and I know that it's been really popular for about 10 years now, I think, and Norm came out with it um, around sort of 2000 something and over the sort of preceding 10 years, the American kind of literature exploded with this is like the way that you prioritize healthcare. Um, there were a couple of things wrong with that, uh, which have now become very clear and apparent and people now I think are much more uh, sort of cognizant of it, particularly after COVID. One is that Daniels profoundly, I think, misunderstood the social determinants of health and many people who now refer to it also misunderstanding it, is that social determinants of health, when understood more in detail according to what social epidemiologists are doing, they don't study the goods. They're not, deter they're not studying the determinants of health. They're studying the determinants of disease and illness. So when we say that there is, you know, and we need social determinants of health, that's not right. Um, what we're saying is that there are harms that are being distributed by social uh, organizations and relationships that need to be addressed. Um, and so what happens is that when you have an accountability of a reasonless procedure inside the hospital deciding who should get health care, what you're doing is that you're ignoring all the harms that cause people to come into the hospital in the first place. Um, and that accountability for reasonableness does not give any moral weight to the harms that brought people into the hospital. And so Michael, by relying on accountability for reasonableness, does two things incorrectly. One is that it doesn't incorporate any other notions of rectificatory or compensatory justice. It just thinks of it as a valuable good that needs to be prioritized, and we're just going to use different kinds of principles to figure out how to prioritize it. And second is that it actually ignores the moral weight of actually the harms that are being caused that bring people into the hospital, and therefore healthcare has, you know, sort of some role to correct those harms, and this account that Michael is providing doesn't do that. The third very quickly sort of a response that I would say is that, you know, there's a huge gap between human rights literature and the real world. And we know this from practice is that no matter how much, how many articles are written or how much laws are created is that the practice is very far from what the literature says. And this really, I think, comes to, uh, came to point where in Michael, he writes um, to this extent of regarding the right to a health system, he writes, states already endeavor to ensure that there are enough healthcare providers and healthcare facilities within their borders. If they fail to do so, which some do, that should be seen as a governance failure and not evidence the requirement is too demanding. And I think that this is uh, just simply you know, unrealistic is that we have a global agenda called universal health coverage. And the whole point is to get governments to have a basic health system and provide some basic health care. So to say that this is somehow a failure in governance and not too demanding is just um, very disconnected from the reality of what's happening in the world. So if a right to health care is to have any meaning, even in this very limited sense, really have to contend with a real world where most governments are simply unable or unwilling to provide a health system, let alone an equitably distributed health care. So with that, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. And I'm really looking forward to not only a discussion, but many years of discussion in this really um, great area that I love so much. And I'm so excited that all of you are part of it. Thank you. Frida, thank you so much. Um, a lot of food for thought. And uh, as you say, you know, um, the fodder for many rich conversations that we need to have uh, perhaps more quickly than over the years, uh, a little more quickly, I think we need to have these conversations and come up with better solutions because we're surely being tested. Michael, I wonder if you could uh, come back on um, and just provide a few more reflections and response, and then we'll get the whole big panel 
back up for uh, Q&A and cross-conversation. Yeah, so let me say most importantly, thank you for such rich and detailed comments, uh, many of which you know really go beyond what's in the text and even to me identified areas that are, um, I wasn't 100% um, sure where my the work could go. And one thing that this has done listening to your comments is, you know, after you've written a book and it's taken a long time to come out, you think, oh my goodness, do I really have a lot more to say on this? And hearing all your comments made me realize, like I had three paper ideas um, just of places where you told me, hey, you need to say more about this. And I realized you're right. Even after this big, thick, dense book, there's a lot more I need to say. So thank you, uh, first and foremost. I'm going to be very brief in the interest of um, allowing people to ask questions. And uh, selfishly, I want to hear a lot of them. But uh, a few things to just briefly say. Um, one, the political economy point is a very interesting one. I think there's a lot to say about intellectual property rights that I don't get into in the text. Um, one thing that's interesting when reading some of the relevant intellectual property laws is the way that they do make some ex exceptions for um, certain essential medicines. And this might be some evidence that the broader international uh, legal system gives some priority to healthcare goods, even among the many um, uh, goods that they recognize the subjects as rights. So there's other things that you theoretically have a right to, and yet there's no exemptions from these uh, intellectual property rules. Uh, might this be evidence that actually there is some recognition that healthcare matters? And yet if we, again, to get to Schroeder's point about reality and academics, the reality is it is nonetheless the case that the current intellectual property system um, has to be understood as at least a severe constraint on uh, ways that we might want to realize a right to health care, as I put it. Um, and so there's a lot to be said there. Um, I will just briefly note that pact. Um, on the points about, um, you know, interpretation, uh, that's just great work. And I, I, uh, I just want to say it to, to Lisa, basically, hey, we should have a whole bunch of conversations as well. Um, there was part of me that at one point wanted to do a sort of update piece that was like, you know, the complex right to health and COVID. But then I was thinking, oh my goodness, there's just too many papers on COVID. Nobody's going to take them anymore. And yet I'm wondering if maybe there's something there as well. Um, but on the right to health versus right to health care piece, and also the why does anybody go back to health? Uh, Hofeld piece. I mean, I do think that there is still something to these idea of Hofeldian rights. Um, and I actually think that in some ways, um, I, I have a piece on this uh, in the Journal of Value Inquiry where I actually say, if we take the Hofeldian methodology that he uses seriously, we can see that it is a methodology that um, calls on us to look at the actual legal phenomena that we have. And what I say is we now can apply that actually to international law as well. Um, but one thing that I think we do when we really apply that uh, methodology that we still see is this name need for a specific form of correlativity that has a specific tie to particular goods. Um, and I think based on what Schroeder just said, he'd say, you know, well, actually all the broader right to health and rights to public health can fulfill this as well. I'm still somewhat skeptical. Let's just put it that way. Um, but again, you know, much smarter than people, pe people than I disagree. So maybe I should be epistemically humble about this. Um, moving on, on the points about, uh, I'll note that I do mention Tobes a few times in the text, but you're right that I don't um, engage in depth with that work. Um, on the point about Thompson, um, yes, that's, uh, I think what I just said about Hofeld at least explains where I'm coming from on that, but yes, addressing the Thompson um, would be interesting. It's actually a, a work that you'd mentioned to me once before, and you know, you don't get as a lot of engagement with it generally in rights theory, despite it at one time being a very uh, well-known book, and I think I need to revisit it and read it in greater detail. On Nussbaum, uh, you'll be happy to know that I'm actually writing a paper right now about dignity, um, and it starts off with a discussion of how should we understand political conceptions of dignity, and the first person mentioned is Nussbaum, then it goes through Waldron, Ettenson, um, you know, the debates between San Giovanni and Gilbert. Um, I am aware that that's a gap I need to fill, and I'm trying to fill it right now. 
Um, and I think uh, I will leave it there, except to say that I, um, I, the real world point is well taken. I think we can discuss that at a, at a different date. I think the one thing I'd say about the accountability for reasonableness framework and the discussion of rectificatory justice and the relationship between them, I think one thing that should just keep in the back of our mind here, and I, we can all sort of think, think it through is, you know, how should we view the relationship between um, health rights and health justice more broadly. And one question we might want to ask ourselves, and I'm not going to make a, a big statement on it right here, is to what extent are issues of rectificatory justice um, best encapsulated within the content of the right to health care? Or are they better understood as part of a broader notion of health justice, of which a right is just one part? And if we recognize health rights as defeasible, we might recognize that these other things are actually much more important and can defeat them in certain ways. Um, again, none of those points are enough to really address the such rich comments, but thank you again, and let's move on to questions in the interest of time. Oh, sorry, Michael, I didn't mean to uh, cut you off. I, you know, I was trying to adjust my hair, which seems to be all over the place every time I come into a Zoom, but you know, that's for your entertainment and fodder. Uh, Shraddha, Lisa, Catherine, um, Mike, could we uh, put everybody back up? Could you come back on screen, please? Lovely. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine. Lovely. Um, so we have some time for um, questions and comments. And so uh, I'm asking people to pop things in the Q&A if they would. I think everyone's a bit... Uh, uh, a little uh, sort of sucking in all of this deliciousness, food for the mind, uh, probably while they're trying to scarf some food for their body, given that it is lunchtime. This is the problem with the Zoom things. We can't give people food except intellectual food. Um, I might just ask um, a question or two to, to get it going. And I thought I might start with uh, the critique that Sridhar made of uh, Daniel's uh, right to health. And so I guess this is um, a question perhaps first for Sridhar and then for the others. Um, how do you then make these determinations? Uh, you know, to me, uh, it always seemed that the, uh, Daniel's sort of framework was uh, more of a, you know, as he articulates a process so that, you know, it can be filled up with substantive criteria, including the criteria that you mentioned, right, an account of, of substantive justice and, um, um, you know, racial inequalities, that, that this could be one of the criteria. But I just perhaps uh, you have a different conception of how of how one would determine, um, you know, in any particular uh, context what services are, uh, are included within the public basket of services. And I'd love to hear uh, uh, Lisa, Catherine and Michael on this one. Given that I've just been teaching that, that would be lovely if you could help me out, uh, figure this out. Shuda, could we go to you first? Sure, I'll do it very quickly. I think the, there's two parts to the Daniels approach, right? So one is that, um, you know, if you follow this sort of Rawlsian conception of society, then he argues that, you know, that that society will um, automatically address what he understands to be social determinants of health. And nevertheless, healthcare is really important still uh, for people to have this sort of normal functioning to pursue sort of normal sort of spectrum of life opportunities in any given society. But nevertheless, you have these value conflicts, which is that you will help the people that, you know, many people or the people that need it the most or the people who benefit the most, et cetera. And there's no way to reconcile them. So you have a procedural account. What I was saying is that, um, you know, one, he's misunderstood the social determinants of health, which is that these are harms that society, social organizations, social relationships are creating. And those harms tend to be physiological and mental and biological, and you end up in the hospital because of those. And so when you sort of, when that person comes in and you're sort of saying, well, it doesn't benefit the most people or need and stuff, you need to be able to identify actually that this is a harm that we've created and therefore 
therefore we have a uh, kind of an obligation to address it. So usually in moral philosophy, if you are the person that harms someone, then you have the primary obligation to address that harm. Um, that tends to be sort of a normal starting position. So there has to be some sort of extra weighting in that kind of procedural account of when you can tie social uh, harms as the cause of that uh, that, uh, that health outcome and you need to address that, which is different from sort of just generally thinking about we have limited valuable good and how do we distribute it. So in terms of the specific instance, so even in this case of ventilator allocation, you know, what people were saying is that this African American has got comorbidities and they're sort of not really healthy and so we shouldn't give that person the ventilator because they're not going to benefit as much as someone that's younger. And that's actually the opposite of what we want is that we actually want that individual who has um, been sort of harmed throughout their lives to is now needing care to be given extra priority. So I can't speak to which particular healthcare goods should be in the basket, but I'm more considering about the causes and how we should be addressing and giving weight to the harms that we create that bring into people. So I'll stop talking there. Okay, thanks, uh, Shreda. Um, Lisa, do you want to weigh in? Sure. Um, to a large extent, I'm re relatively agnostic on the you know accountability for reasonableness uh, approach. But what I do want to uh, just emphasize is I think what we what we what the right to health and human, international human rights law doesn't do particularly well is really the the nuts and bolts are for health policymakers in making priority setting decisions. And so, you know, what we what we've seen in practice time and time and again is that you need a human rights framework with something else. And the something else is often ethics, it can be other things, but the ethics alone also is not sufficient. I mean I, I see one of my colleagues uh, from the uh, the former uh, COVID uh, bioethics table, which was set up in the province of Ontario to guide the provincial response to COVID and to bring ethical principles to that, that approach. Uh, when the decisions that were made there were seen to be falling completely afoul of human rights law, realize the need to have human rights lawyers coming together with ethicists. So I think, you know, I think Michael's, you know, suggestion that we should be ecumenical <laughs> in how we approach the right to health, I think is, is very, very apt. It's a critically important tool, but it's, and it's necessary, but alone it's not sufficient. So whether it's Daniel's or some other approach to power setting, I, I don't have an opinion on it. Just, I just know that the, the there, that, that there needs to be filled by something other than rights. Right, how to operationalize them. Okay, uh, Catherine. Well, let me uh, focus my remarks in favor of Norman Daniels' approach. I think the social determinants of health are incredibly powerful. And I think of them in terms of economic and social rights more generally, how we live, work and play according to the World Health Organization definition focuses us on various accesses to what we kind of understand as labor rights, economic and social rights in food, healthcare, as lo alongside sanitation and access to water, uh, and so so forth. Um, so I think that that framework is is uh, an incredibly important one. What I think Norman Daniels and others who focus on reasonableness through accountability add is something to the procedural elements that we expect of our healthcare systems that are that are situated in a medical context, without without losing sight of the social determinants in general. And I think this speaks to Michael's great work in looking at various accountability processes that feed through courts when they're considering the right to health care, but also, also ombudspersons, you know, newly set up or borrowing from earlier models focusing on civil and political rights to understand that they have something to say about the administration of health care, you know, health care burdens, um, lack of access, uh, unfairness within processes that have been set up by medical medical procedures that may be relying on older biomedical approaches that situate the doctor patient relationship as primary and Norman, Norman Daniels allows us to think through far greater trajectories of relationships that still need our uh, attention and so I, I'm just going to speak in defense of, of that approach that really accords with age-old uses of reasonableness 
within legal paradigms. Judges, particularly common law judges, are at home in reasonableness assessments. They feel they're not stepping out of bounds to make these calls, even if they're appropriately deferential to healthcare experts and bioethicists that have been set up to make these decisions. So I think it's a, a really promising framework and I'll, I'll just speak in favour of it without, of course, dismissing the absolute centra centrality of social determinants as to who's making their way into healthcare settings and, and having such burdens there. I have other things to say about Hofeld, <laughs> I have other things to say, um, but I'll, I'll stop there because you probably want to direct the Q&A elsewhere. Oh, no. Well, that's thank you so much. That's really interesting. Michael, do you want to reflect back on that? Do you have some comments on... Um, not a lot. I, I, you know, just one thing that's interesting to just think of the history of the accountability for reasonableness framework is just the way that it was initially put forward as just a theory for insurance decision making, right? And then it's become sort of expanded out more broadly into being this framework for uh, resource setting in a variety of different sectors. And one thing we can reflect upon is, you know, is it fit better for particular purposes than for others? Um, I like it as a way of um, supplementing a uh, basic substantive core, um, to use that language. I think it's good. I think that on its own, it doesn't really do the work of telling us what a right should be. Um, I think on its own, it actually fails in, a, in, in some other settings as well. Um, but I, I think it does add something um, to uh, to the framework, and hopefully, I have some proof of concept in the second half of the book. Okay. Um, now, I have a, another uh, question um, around uh, where we are at in Canada in terms of realizing um, rights to health, and you know, this is um, you know, even in a wealthy country like like Canada, post COVID, you know, there's going to be huge. Um, even right now, there are huge pressures on our healthcare system, um, many more to come, a lot of unmet need that will be surfacing. Uh, at the same time, you know, um, incredible leaps and bounds in technology, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all kinds of uh, innovations coming at us, digital health, virtual care, all of these sorts of things, uh, where, whether they will be publicly funded or not, still to be um, really figured out. And yet, in the jurisprudence um, where Canada is at, it seems is, you know, very, very, very uh, reluctant to move forward in advancing a positive right to health care under section seven, guaranteeing life, liberty and security of the person. And, you know, the most recent sort of potential case where that could have happened was the in the uh, refugee case, uh, the former federal government under Stephen Harper had eliminated um, healthcare coverage for many refugees from so-called safe countries, um, including, you know, um, emergency care, Pregnancy care, you know, clearly it would seem um, engaging, you know, on a on a plain reading, the life and security of the person. Um, and the trial judge in that decision uh, reiterates what she seems sees as the sort of precedent flowing from earlier jurisprudence from the Supreme Court that there is no freestanding right to health care under Section Seven of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But then goes on to find that not, notwithstanding under section 12 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, it is cruel and unusual punishment to deny um, and health insurance coverage for um, refugees. And when you think about that, it is just boggles the mind that one could find that something, the denial of care is cruel and unusual pun punishment, but it does not amount to a deprivation of life or security of the person. So, you know, I, I will now have several expletives after the end of that long commentary, but what the heck? Where do we go with this, Michael? Um, Lisa, you know, uh, Catherine, I know you've studied our system a lot, as many other systems. Shredda, you know, it, it's so depressing. And I, I'd, like to, I'd like to have some hope. So can you give me some? Michael, we'll start with you. Uh, well, I mean, so, I mean, the, the facts of that case are rather particular. And as you know, um, we only ever got the federal court decision. Um, the good news is that the government uh, put 
the program back at the level it had been before. Uh, the bad news is, you know, we haven't got much progress since then, right? So it was a long court case that basically got us to the point where the government, a new government came in and said, you know what, we'll restore everything back to the way it was 10 years earlier. And if that's the best case we've had going through the courts recently, I think this is further evidence of my um, concern that maybe the courts aren't the best tool that we have available to us to bring these things about. Um, you know, Section 12 is a very interesting provision. Um, it's, you know, if you look at the, the case, it actually talks about cruel and unusual treatment rather than punishment. Um, and this is a very rare language. We have it in international law. But constitutionally, you very rarely see references to cruel and unusual treatment. And what this might allow us to do is um, have a sort of sui generis, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, too late in the day here for me to use Latin, to have a unique approach jurisprudentially to a concept that is sort of um, unmarked land that we could maybe build some sort of argument from. But again, whether the courts are actually going to get us the result that we want is uh, you know an open question, and whether it's worth the resources is an open question. I think, as I say in the book, Canada in some ways has things like Section 1 uh, that can serve as safeguards against some of the problems we've seen in other countries. It also has a law of precedent that can avoid over litigation concerns. So we're not going to get an overly expansive right. We're not going to get over litigation, most likely because of the uh, procedural safeguards we have. But I don't know. I'm still not super convinced that the courts are the way to go here. So uh, the good news is we have other tools that are available to us. Um, but how effective they're going to be, you know, does maybe require speaking to some of those political economy issues that Catherine was going to. Lisa or Catherine, can you be more positive? <laughs> um, uh, shall we go to Lisa and then Catherine? Um... So, I, I mean, it's both sides of the coin here. Um, I, think, I think that decision animates that ideological climate in which we speak about the right health so effectively. Um, you know, uh, it, the, 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 re the reluctance to recognize a positive entitlement to health care animates the judicial and legislative, to some extent, legislative approach in Canada. But what I find really remarkable about that decision, and I often cite that case when I'm talking about the right to health and the way in which it's frankly impossible to keep health out of the, the framework of the protection of human rights because we can't chop up, you know, that we are a, co a coherent whole and health is part of those interests. And so what I find really fascinating about that case is that despite the strictures, the ideological strictures that the, the court is under, it could not exclude health and the protection of health from charter rights. Granted, it's not the it may not be the best way to apply the rights that are in the charter, but for me, it shows, you know, it shows the way the ideology really, it, it, it distorts our interpretation of, of the rights that are in the charter, but it cannot really prevent them. And I often, you know, I go back time and time again to Henry Shoes, that seminal work a thousand years ago on basic rights where he says, you know, we should, I can't remember exactly how he says it, but he more or less says, you know, we should kind of chuck the whole edifice and just do what is necessary to protect rights. And to some extent, I think we see that we, we have internet, we have rights that are constructed in the context of this ideology, I mean, why do we have progressive realization within resources of economic, social, and cultural rights? Such a different standard for civil and political. There's some, the, 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 the defect is baked into the system in a whole, in, in some sense. So I, I don't know, Colleen, if that gives anything positive there, but I do think that there's, there's a little bit of hope in, in that decision. Yeah, I think uh, for me, Lisa, the, the, you know, the, the need I mean, the, the need was so acute vis-a-vis uh, -vis refugees, but so many Canadians are going without um, the basic care that they need and, uh, you know, without any platform for redress, um, you know, not any hope to kind of push it uh, in the direction that it should be, you know, without, un without causing all the problems of over litigation of health rights, as you mentioned, that we've seen in some Latin American jurisdictions. Um, Catherine, do you want to 
I don't know if you're aware. Yeah, so, yeah, I'd also kind of look to the case uh, within the paradigm of questions of litigation, the use of litigation, the idea of the judiciary not not leading necessarily with with thick conceptions of rights and waiting or perhaps catalyzing other institutions to follow. Um, so that could be a subtext here of the preference for a cruel and unusual treatment framework from a um, life, liberty and security framework. And mm. I, I, I think it is a, a thinner conception of when the courts will step in to use that latter framework. I'd suggest here that Hofeld becomes useful and I, I'm not just being opportunistic here. I, I think Hofeld's typology allows lawyers to understand doctrinal steps and avenues in a very sophisticated way because he kind of totally conceptualizes different places in which both policymakers and lawyers can go. Uh, his language is a claim right and a duty, but he also offers these conceptions of privileges and immunities and disabilities. Uh, these are legal relations that are set up everywhere. And so in this case, rather than, you know, stamp out a right in which there would be immediate duty emanating from a court, the, the court is rather setting out a place in which there had been an immunity that you know medical providers could just decide not to uh, to withhold treatment or or or, um, or provide it which as as he correlates can then correlates with a disability on all refugees because they just don't get treatment and they've got nowhere to go in the legal system and what the court is doing is lifting that immunity and removing that disability it's a very different conception at work than simply a a straight out right articulated with a straight out duty, the legal relations are so much more nuanced. Um, and, you know, we can still use Hofeld's uh, framework to think through different legal systems. It's an incredible tool for comparative lawyers, um, crossing civil law and common law divides, understanding a case through a very different map discursively and anal analytically than simply reading a case and seeing, well, based on former charter jurisprudence, where would be the next step that would be not too great, but still reflective of basic values of dignity that we want to see upheld without being totally counter majoritarian about it. So I, I, I just kind of put in a plug for continuing to kind of interrogate Hofeld's conceptions when we're making these, the, these uh, analyses of where courts will and will not go. And particularly that's useful for the political economy framework when you team Hofeld with Robert Hale's legal realist insights about what permissions the state is giving through its protections of contract and property, then you, you, you do get an interesting analysis. Um, so I'll, I'll, I, I know in the interest of time, there, there isn't much more to, to really massage these points, but I, I'd love to talk more with every one of these panelists about them. Yeah, you see that kind of the liberal conceptions of um, your know, R sort of permeate the, the trial judge, um, trial judge's decision. So there's a lot of discussion of how the refugees are, are not permitted to work, you know, so that, you know, they can't participate in the market, uh, blah, 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 you know, and these are because of government restriction. Now, of course, ignoring the fact that most of them probably, even if they were permitted to work, may not be able to afford the damn thing. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, we uh, we have uh, we have these issues. Shridha, your, your final comment, and then we need to move to close up, unfortunately. Um, it, it, this is more about to you, right? I mean, you must be, you know, well versed in this idea about um, seeking, you know, the courts to for equity and justice. It just doesn't work in that sort of quick way. I think that um, I wish it was, and but I'm also now wishing, as we now see the politicization of every court in the world, that you know the the court is one piece in a social movement for that kind of. Um, achievement. So yeah, I have I have no more to say. But other than that, that that maybe the court isn't the only place that we can find equity and and what we're looking for. No, I think that's that's true. Um, although one could hope when one can't find it anywhere else that it, they might at least you know be a, a spur or a help uh, towards it when the political processes seem to be so inadequate these days. Um, Michael, we had one last question in the in the Q and A about um, wondering if the pluralistic quality of the right to health in the book's title refers to its three different aspects 
uh, or does it also refer to the pluralism of the values that coexist in society and that makes it difficult to decide on the content of the basket, for instance? Do you just want to answer that and then we will uh, finish? Yeah, so uh, just quickly, I dropped in the chat if anybody's interested on the uh, point about whether there's anything to be excited about. Uh, I do have a paper out that suggests that there's, it, from a matter of, inst of uh, the law of precedent in Canada, now might actually be a time where one could run unique positive rights arguments. Um, so that's an Osgood Hall Law Journal. Um, but to answer the question more directly, um, yes, I do have a pluralistic view of values more generally, and that's operating in the background. One reason, what pluralist here is supposed to be referencing the three elements, but I actually think it's um, a bit misleading because I do see these three elements as part of a moral unity, as opposed to being, um, you know, three important things that stand uh, distinct from one another, which is why I've moved to calling, to calling this a complex model rather than a pluralist, because I think it, uh, it, it, it's misleading in two ways. Um, once one putting the th thing that you put your finger on, and secondly, it just doesn't stress how much this really is a moral unity. And the last thing I'll say before Colleen takes over is thank you so much for these great comments and conversation. I hope you all will continue to have conversations with me because I learned a lot just in this hour and I, I there's many years ahead that we can continue hopefully.